Today on the podcast, we have a very special guest from the UK. His name is Michael Hutchinson, and he's been studying and teaching in the KYM tradition for over four decades. He's a research scientist, as well as versed in the ancient teachings of India. And the thing that really stands out to me about Michael and his work that I think we can all benefit from thinking about is he's very thoughtful. He's not in a rush. He's got the space to allow things to unfold in good timing. You can tell from the pace of his voice, from the way his mind works, that he's not rushing through life. And I think probably a lot of that comes from all these 40 years of observing the breath, feeling the breath, sensing the breath, and being with the breath. Somehow that pranayama or breath work changes your mind. And that's what the Yoga Sutra says. That's what we're taught by Deskachar, that it changes how your mind functions. So I look forward to sharing with you Michael Hutchinson. And I think you'll really benefit from this approach that he takes, that it doesn't need to be complicated. It can be very simple and we can get so much benefit from optimizing our breathing in a gentle way over time that will change our lives. So let's go. Let's talk to Michael. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour. My name is Amy Wheeler and I'm your host. The Yoga Therapy Hour is here to support you on your mental, emotional, and spiritual journey. We talk about things like nervous system regulation, spiritual connection, how to be more involved in your community, how to communicate well, how to manage your mental health. There are so many things that we are excited to share with you in season five of the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. And we hope that you will share it with your friends, family, colleagues. All right, let's get into today's episode. Today, I would like to welcome you to the Yoga Therapy Hour. And our guest is Michael Hutchinson. And Michael, where are you joining us from today? I live in a little village in the north of Hampshire in the UK. Mm. Is uh, about 40, 50 miles from London, west oh, of London. Beautiful. And and you're glowing. I noticed as soon as we got on the call, you were glowing. And you said you've kind of been out gardening today and getting some vitamin D and sunshine. Well, I've been doing that most days after a cold, wet spring. We have mm-hmm. some glorious sunshine every afternoon this week. So I've been making the most of it to catch up with things. Mm. Sounds lovely. Well, Michael, I feel so honored to interview you. You're you're someone who has been a <laughs> practitioner in the Krishnamacharya tradition for 40 years. You've been teaching for 35. You've studied with TKV Deskachar. And when I saw that you had written this book called Breath for Health, I jumped up and down because... I haven't seen very many senior teachers in our tradition take the time, energy, focus, effort to write a book specific to breath work in the Vini Yoga tradition. Uh-huh. Is this the first or do you know of any others? Well, this is one of the things, Amy, that really I felt placed the responsibility for writing this book on my shoulders. Mm. Initially, I thought, well, we don't even have a translation of the Hatha Pradipika from our tradition. Right. But then I thought, I don't have the command of Sanskrit. And then the Mohans, Dr. Mohan, took this on. And their book contains notes from Mr. Mohan's studies with Krishnamacharya 40 years ago. And so that job was done. Mm-hmm. But in terms of a book that was really accessible, no, there wasn't anything. A book that was both accessible to the raw beginner, never even thought before about what their breath might be doing, but would also be of use to the yoga teacher or therapist and the sort of hints and ideas 
as to how to help people return to what I would call optimal the cycle of breath. Well, I had received a pre-release copy of your book and I was rereading it this morning. Your book actually isn't going to be launched until December 2023 slash January 2024. But when I was reading it this morning, that's what struck me is this is a book that is meeting the common person with very common language in simple terms, but it's teaching them something very deep and profound about breath work, which is a rare combination. And I think sometimes when you have the ability to make something so simple and understandable, maybe people could even miss the depth and how profound it is because it is delivered in such a simple, understandable way. I would like to think that my book might be like some of the books I've had for 40 years and I've read them at one level, but now, 40 years later, I can read them at another level. Mm. So this book may help someone stay on their shelf for years, who knows, and then they think, oh, I must start doing those exercises again, and then they'll see, well, actually, there's more to it. it people <laughs> can only take in what, what hooks. Thank you, Amy. That's a really fantastic thought. People can only take in what they have the hooks for. Mm. So when I'm reading this book, after studying in this tradition for 25 years, I'm picking out these really deep gems. But I can also see giving this to a student of mine that would gain a lot from it, but not understand the depth of what they're actually learning. And that reminds me of TKV Deskachar. I couldn't ask for a high compliment. I hope that I'm representing his work because there's a lot of his work and his thinking that has gone into this book. Right. I remember I was taking a seminar with him once in San Francisco, and there were a couple hundred people in the room. And he started off with simple tadasana with intentional breath and movement, you know, the IBM formula. And a bunch of people after five or seven minutes left the room. They thought it was somehow boring or not a workout, or I don't know what was going on in their mind. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, the formula of set the intention, then start the breath, then start the movement, finish the movement, finish the breath, like that whole bracketing is so mm -hmm. profound, but they didn't have the hooks for it. Quite. All in good time. Yeah. So when you said earlier that maybe you were a person that could write this book for us and our students, mm -hmm. is that because you have had these 40 plus years of experiential learning, but you're also a scientist and someone who can read the research on respiratory physiology. Is that why you think you're uniquely ready to do something like this? That was the third thing. Since my teens, I've always been interested in writing and particularly in reading and writing poetry. And I wish I have some small degree of accomplishment and in writing stories. I think that this was a gift, I presume to say, that I could bring to this project. And that sort of gave me, I hope, a unique combination of experience and skills. And so that's why I felt that this responsibility fell on my shoulders. I read in your book that you were a very introverted teenager. And I think that it's almost being introverted and looking deeply into self since you were a young, young person. That lays the foundation for being able to write clearly and to share deep experiences and thoughts. Yes, it was a breakthrough moment for me, you know, to a very troubled time at school to find that I could write. Mm. Okay. Last thing before we dive into the juiciness of this topic you just said that this fell on your shoulders as a responsibility. And I find that interesting. I've worked for a long time. I've always had the inclination to work in what is in one way or another a public service field. And so the idea of responsibility comes naturally to some people or people who, who've grown up in a certain way. And acceptance of responsibility has been part of my sort of adult growing up, if you like. Mm. So you see writing this book as 
stewardship of caring for the teachings as well as your teachers yes. and passing it forward for others to benefit. I hope so. Yeah. Which is very different than a lot of authors who are maybe looking for fame or fortune or oh, ego orientation, not. you know, but that's um, obviously not you. Bit scary that. Mm. <laughs> Okay, breathe, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw your whole your whole being freeze up with those words. Oh, yes. <laughs> the F words just took you into like a frozen state. Of... <laughs> um, okay, so let's go back to words that feel good to you. What does breath optimization mean? You told me that you're writing about breathing optimization or breath optimization. What is that? Well, I really have to preface it by saying as a scientist that when we talk about optimization, as soon as you get anywhere near optimum, that's good enough. So I'm not looking for everyone to breathe in an exact similar way. I want to, as Mr. Deskachar did, respect everybody's individuality. On the other hand, lay out basic principles of the complete breathing cycle from when air starts to come in until it finishes leaving. How is this meant to happen in the most effective and efficient, relaxing way? So effective and efficient, meaning that you get good amount of oxygen into your system. Right. You're letting go of the carbon dioxide out of the system. But I think the key that I see you talk about in your book is in a relaxed way. There's not like a striving or I've got to get a 40 second breath count. No, in the, as much as possible, the feeling that one is allowing one's breath to do the work in its own best way. So to rediscover a relationship with our breath. When we're tiny babies, you know, apart from relationship with mother, big relationship is with breath. Mm, say more about that. That's a beautiful image, actually. Well, I've been prompted to look into the way that infants breathe by a physiotherapist who attended my online Breath for Health classes in 2020. Mm. And she took issue with something I proposed is that at some point in our early lives, breathe optimally. And she said, well, Michael, that doesn't necessarily happen. It can happen, but it doesn't necessarily happen. And that gave me to look into how infants and you know, toddlers breathe, because when we're born, the relationship between the various parts of the body responsible for breathing is actually quite different importantly different. Now, breathing, as my student said, the, the people who, who die from respiratory conditions are the very old and the very young. Mm. As a scientist, I look to see what, what happens with the breath when things get difficult, because that's the way to test my ideas. So are you saying that to have this optimization, is that individual to each person? Or is there kind of a blueprint that we could follow to start experimenting with our own breath? As you've seen in my book, Amy, I start with really basic things like, you know, can you breathe out slowly? Can you breathe out through your nose? Mm. When you lie down, can you feel your tummy moving, lifting as you breathe in? and falling as you breathe out and start with these very basic things. And by working through my book, everyone can work at his or her own pace. And there may be certain chapters that someone needs to spend more time on or some chapters where light bulb moment, yes, now my breath works so much better. Now people will work through my book individually the degree to which they approach optimum breathing may be better in some respects and not quite in others. But getting near optimum, just go and live a normal, happy life. Not worry 
it's not a thing where you have to worry about getting your breathing exactly right as you picked up earlier on the idea is that once you've retrained your breath you know for 23 hours and 50 minutes out of 24 each day your breath is doing its best for you without you even being aware of it so what i think i just heard you say is that by practicing even 10 minutes a day of some type of conscious breathing, whatever chapter appeals to you, that can impact the other 23 hours and 50 minutes of your day. That is what my students report. You know, the breathing that they've learned with me when they need to become conscious of their breathing, for example, in a stressful situation, they find that their breathing can respond for them in a helpful way. So that must mean that something has gone in at the level of the breath. I'm not with my students 24-7. Don't check them for optimum breathing. <laughs> they, don't, don't, they don't live with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, <Your> poor wife. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't live with me. Of course, you and I know that traditionally in India, centuries ago, someone would go, and live with his teacher and would be seen every day or quite a lot of the day, but we don't have that. Yeah. So when I was looking at your book this morning, I, I saw one of the chapters on simply lying down on your back and putting your legs on a small stool and practicing breathing exercises. And I thought, well, that's common sense. That's an easy thing that anybody could do, almost to the point of you might think, oh, I'm going to skip over that part because, of course, you can lie down and follow your breath. But I have to tell you, I was talking to our students in the Optimal State Yoga Therapy School the other day and talking to them about how when you lie down, you might get your breath to be almost twice as long as when you're sitting up. And, you know, when you're sitting up and gravity is pushing down on your diaphragm and your organs, that's a very different situation than when you lie your body down and everything kind of flattens and spreads and there's more space for the diaphragm to move and the inter-abdominal organs to move. And they were really blown away by that because it had never occurred to them that breathing in a lying down position could be so different than breathing in a seated position. I think your book, it's unassuming and it seems simple, but that's profound to say, oh my gosh, my breath is twice as long when I'm lying down usually. What do you think of that? I've noticed so many times, Amy, that I can teach someone in a class or one-to-one -one situation, the lying down in this comfortable position and using some degree of belly breathing is there. And then as soon as that student sits up, chest breathing resumes. The breath doesn't becomes more shallow. Right. Sort of automatically. It's not conscious. Maybe they're just going back to their habitual way that they've always breathed in a sitting position or standing. Well, my physiotherapist student said that the way that we breathe habitually is established by the time we're aged between 12 and 15. Mm. During those 12 to 15 years, at some point, there are various stressors in childhood. And also remarkably, she says, she's seen patterns of breathing common within families, suggesting mm. that children learn the right way they think to breathe from their parents or older siblings. And, and is that unconsciously through observation? Yes, unconscious copying observation. I mean, we are born sponges. We are born copycats. It's survival. Mm. And dad are breathing that way. That must be right. Doesn't feel quite right, but it will be all right when I grow up. If any conscious thinking there is, just happen. It must also be tied into nervous system regulation and co-regulation that maybe if the parents are not regulated, then the uh, nervous system yes. picks up. Yes, I know. I bow to your superior knowledge here. Mm. 
Well, I don't know if it's superior. It's just some well, I like to kind I, of brainstorm as we go, you know, like, I've, oh, I would I've read one book by Stephen Porges. That's mm, yeah. right. Right. Okay. So let's get back to the areas that you're so passionate about. One area is that you say we can use bhavana or visualization to help us learn to breathe better. Tell us about that. Well, the prime example really is I was teaching one of my long-term one-to-one students who is now training within our tradition. Whatever I seemed to try with some people, when they breathed in, the shoulders went up. Mm. Seemed to be, you know, how can I break this link? So I just said to her, Jane, think about inhaling forward of your heart. And that's a bhavana. Bhavana is a cross between sort of thinking, feeling, and imagining, sort of feeling your way into something, feeling your way into an idea, the idea that your breath might be able to come in and create space forward of your heart. She did this, she breathed in, she repeated this several times, her shoulders stayed down. And when she'd done this for six breaths, as instructed, she said, Michael, that's magic. I'm just doing that in my own body. And I, I can see using the top one third of your lungs, you're trying to take a big breath in and the shoulders go. <gasps> but when you have that visualization of the heart, and I'll, I'll show on the YouTube video version of this, the heart expanding out forward, it really does help to keep the shoulders down and expand through the chest, the middle chest, maybe. This is the whole idea. I could go a lot further into this, but one of the keys to this is that contrary to repeated suggestions by my teachers, Jill Lloyd and until she passed away, sadly, Radha Sundararajan, my instruction was to practice the full alternate nostril breathing, Nardi Shodhana. But in in defiance of this instruction, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, because it worked for me, for many years I practiced something called Analoma Ujjayi, which is explained fully in the Mohans by Krishnamacharya, in the Mohan's version of the Hatha Yoga Padipika. But I've been doing this way on Paul Harvey's instruction from many years. And a part of this, I breathe out like this, okay? I always breathe in with this bhavana because it was something that Paul Harvey said a long time ago, which is that, you no. Know, due to having a rather stooped posture in childhood, mm. his breastbone had never grown to its full length. So I was aware that as a teenager, I'd also had a very stooped posture. I remember lying in bed and pulling my shoulders back to try to correct this. I think I was doing some good because at fascia underlying supporting muscle here, I was keeping this open, but to actually correct this stooped posture, only my breath could do this. Only my breath could give me a more open and confident posture. I just want to break that down for people because you're not aware of the anatomy that's happening inside your body. It, you can't really picture that when you inhale, all the little alveoli expand, your lungs expand like balloons. And that naturally from the inside out causes your thoracic spine to go from a hunched position into straight up, but it's, it's happening from the inside. It's not because you're like, Oh, put my shoulders back. It's that the lungs filled up and almost, especially if you breathe into the front of the heart, like you described with your student, Jane, it just happens from the inside out. Is that what you're saying? Partly, but there is more to it. When we breathe in, that creates a suction in the chest cavity. A vacuum? It creates a vacuum. 
if you think about the ribs, the ribs are like hoops. They go round into the spine. The ribs are like the ship or arches in a building. They're very strong. But this area, you've got cartilage here. You've just got a little bone down the middle. It's actually quite flat. And so, especially when we're young, it would be possible for the suction needed to draw the breath in through the narrow airways of the young child to suck the chest in. And so what we have, each side of the breastbone between the five uppermost ribs are what are called parasternal muscles. And before reading a book by Patrick McEwen, who is a disciple of Professor Buteyko, I didn't even know the word parasternal. And I have to thank Patrick because that made me go and look into the research into the function of these muscles. And so I realized that these, what these muscles do, they actually exert leverage to keep the breastbone forwards. Now, we can't consciously do that. I can't say, everyone in the class, engage your parasternal muscles because they don't respond to conscious command. They do respond to commands from the breath. Mm. Breath tells them to work, they'll work. This is what Mr. Deskachar was teaching us when he was doing this, showing us this breath, do you remember? Yeah, just a simple sitting and then opening up, bringing up your hand behind you a little bit, back to your heart, yes. and then switching sides. So it's like a stretch across here, but also a bhavana of opening under the resting hand. That's what Mr. Deskachar was teaching. And I suppose I could have taught Jane that, but on the other hand, thinking about the breath coming in forward of the heart, you don't need to move the hands. I like little things with the breath that people can do at their desks without anybody noticing. Mm-hmm. So just that example you gave when I did my yoga therapy internship at the KYM and that literally hundreds of students would do this simple arm open on the inhale, down on the exhale. And on one hand, you could think, what the heck does that do? That might be, as some people in quotes might say, that's a waste of my time. But what I hear you saying is, you know, these parasternal muscles and their function. I mean, there's so much going on physiologically, skeletal muscular changes. There's so much happening in just yes. a simple opening and closing. Exactly. But the good news is we don't have to think about how to do it. All right. we need to do is say, please breath. When you first come in, open here. And you know, if we keep asking, the breath will remember how to do it because it blooming well had to do it when we were very young. And then as you say, like with your student who could feel the breath opening in front of her sternum or in front of her heart, she can go back to that seven different times during the day, waiting at the best stop, sitting in her office, having a hard conversation. Yeah. Teaching it to her, you know, fellow staff members at the veterinary college where she teaches. Yeah. So... One of the things I learned at the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandaram about breath was kind of like inhale nose, then chest, then rib cage, and then down into the belly, mm -hmm. and then exhale from the belly, the rib cage, the chest, and the nose. So there was like a, if you want to use a visualization, a downward flow on the inhalation from the nose to the belly, and an upward flow on the exhalation from the belly to the nose. Would that be a more advanced version of what you taught your student? Are you just working with the front of the chest as kind of like a step-by-step -step or krama approach to the full and complete breath? Or for her, was that what she needed? And therefore, that was the technique. Two things. It was what Jane needed at the time. Also, what you're describing, Amy, is a conscious recreation of the optimal cycle of breathing 
as now being able to find the physiological research to confirm that that is the case. This is what respiratory physiologists refer to as quiet breathing. Mm. It's a quiet, relaxed, less effortful, efficient. Now, that which you describe is actually a breathing exercise. Where I want us all to be going is that that's happening 24-7 unconsciously because by practicing 10 minutes a day, we've restored this optimum breathing cycle. And then importantly, it will support us because your breath wants to support you. Your breath wants to help not just keep you alive in existence. It wants to support you. It wants to do more for you than that. So that brings me to a quote that I read, and maybe this is what you were saying to Jane, but I think there's something even deeper to take from it. You said, ask your breath to help create space in your heart. I'm thinking of actually creating physical space, but what about mental, emotional space or spiritual space? Are you also going there? Well, I didn't want to put spooky ideas like chakras in my book because I thought that might say <laughs> And I'll just point out you have chakras behind you over your left shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, yes. But only because thanks to a meditation that I was given by a lady called Saraswati when she was teaching at, at the KYM, she gave me a meditation on the breath thinking about the breath at this chakra, this chakra, this chakra, and so on, and then all the way back up again as I breathed out. And I did that faithfully every day for six months. Mm -hmm. And in this way, I began to develop a relationship with my chakras, nothing to do with lotuses, colors, animals, mantras, anything like that just purely locating my chakras through mindful breathing. The depth of your own practice allowed you to do that daily for six months. But in your book, you're saying you wanted to keep it more simple, maybe more scientific, cool. less esoteric. But if you look in my book, you'll see that there are, in fact, references effectively to the heart chakra and then to the Manipurika chakra, the sort of fire center uh, above the navel, for example. There are some and even the references potentially to the throat chakra, but I keep these things very light and I don't start using Sanskrit. I just want people to feel what their breath can do in terms of opening and awareness. I love this approach. It's the approach of Deskachar, obviously, to meet people where they are. But I also hear you saying that if we get really cognitive and intellectualize, I should do this breathing pattern because that ratio is listed in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika for enlightenment. Like you're almost bypassing the work. And I hear you saying, let's bring it down to the most simple ways mm. to breathe and feel it and experience it. Exactly. The words of Mr. Deus Gachar in his book, um, Heart of Yoga, are exactly this. We must acutely sense and feel the movement of the breath within. And I think that was, in a sense, in effect, Mr. Deus Gachar's definition of pranayama mm. is not opening and closing your nostrils, you know, it is not breathing slowly, rapidly to this ratio or that ratio. It's getting into a place where you can at some point in with your nostrils or in your throat or even forward of your heart or deeper, you're feeling or sensing the breath or something to do with the breath. And that is what makes it pranayama, not what you can achieve in terms of breath length. Breath length is helpful 
because it gives you time and patience and space to experience what the breath is doing. But for that, what sort of breathing do you need? 20 seconds is good, 30 seconds is better. 40 seconds, do you need to go beyond that? Why? If you can't put that awareness in in 40 seconds. You know, I've started every morning just lying in bed, putting one hand on my chest and one hand on my belly, and just for 20 minutes, just feeling my own breath move in and out of my body. And mm. and I think that a simple exercise has made more of a shift in my state of mind all day long than the asana practice that I get up and do for an hour afterwards. Somehow I feel really embodied organically from the inside. Mm. I don't know if in my asana practice, I'm like, have this image of the shape my body needs to make. And so it's kind of an outside in thing, but just feeling my own body breathe itself. It's profound. It's beautiful. And I just want to share it because I think there are so many millions of people that don't even know they have an inside in terms of experience. Yes. See, when we get into these high levels of training for yoga teaching and yoga therapist training, we're learning all these advanced techniques, but I don't know your experience in working with people. Cause I know you're also a yoga therapist and mm -hmm. you're the chair of the British council for yoga therapy. Yes, God help me. <laughs> but literally 90% of the people, I'm just trying to get them to feel their breath and all the advanced techniques are nowhere to be found. Yeah, exactly heartwarming to hear you say that. So you are a scientist. You've read the research. Is there a piece of research that you think our listeners would benefit from knowing about or hearing about? Is there something that kind of shows in a simple way why we should buy into this concept of learning to optimize your breathing? Can you think of that on the spot? That might be a hard question. Well, 35 years ago, I heard a talk by a doctor called Claude Lum, L-U-M. I think it's a half Chinese, I think. Mm. And he was working at Papworth Hospital near Cambridge. And I did read a bit about his background recently, but he'd worked in all sorts of places, all sorts of people. And he'd come to the conclusion that the way people breathed was important. And so he started to you know, teach his patients how to breathe. If he saw that they were breathing in a particularly tense way, and they were not aware that they were breathing a certain way. And he often found that some of the symptoms and problems which they presented with would be helped or even go away. So much so that his colleagues at Papworth became aware of this and if they had patients with baffling symptoms, they would say, well, why not go to Dr. Lum and see? And there is still respiratory physiotherapists in the UK. I don't know to what extent, but some of them still teach a Papworth breathing, which is a very simple you know, ratio method of breathing. And I think it just shows that we don't need to be very precise about how we teach breathing to people initially, so long as we're not teaching them anything that will later be confusing. We can just say, you know, breathe in for four seconds, breathe out for seven seconds, breathe in for five, breathe out for six. It's the very mental act of focusing on your breath that starts to create changes, exactly what you were saying earlier about lying in bed and then spending several minutes every morning focusing on your breath. I don't think you've said any particular way you might be feeling how the breath is moving, that's all. It's a treatment for myself, but it's also an assessment. Uh -huh. like there are mornings where Yes. I'll try to do inhale equals exhale. Let's just say six second inhale, six second exhale. And I cannot exhale for six seconds. That tells me something about my internal state. So I'm wow. I'm kind of checking in with myself. And then when I notice, okay, Amy, you're, you're holding on top of the inhale and not able to have a long exhale, 
on that morning, I'll work to lengthen my exhalation until I can get like a exhalation that's maybe twice as long as my inhalation. But that might take 20 minutes. Amy, be careful here because you're giving me material for another book. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so I think that checking in with your breath, and this is where I think a qualified yoga teacher or yoga therapist can help so many people. If I give them, say, five count inhale, five count exhale, they'll come and they'll say, oh, I can't do the inhale or I can't do the exhale. And then that's where having a guide to help you understand what might be happening in your system and how you can work with that, not to force yourself into a certain ratio, Mm. but to use it as observation about the state of your system. I think that's where having a guide can help. Such a good point, both about having a guide and about that that on a particular person, on a particular day, a particular ratio, may not be an appropriate application. So, Michael, is there anything else that you're like wanting to get the message out about that that you feel we need to know could be in your book or out of your book? Is there anything that we haven't covered that you would feel like, I need to share this? Well, I went through the 13 questions that you sent me. Mm. And if I can just scroll down for a moment. Question eight. How does yoga therapy, yoga connect with diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice? Mm. Well, the thing I want to say is that optimal breathing is pretty much the same for all people and actually all mammals breathe in a similar way. Obviously, they're mostly on all fours, but leaving that aside, And being rich or advantaged doesn't mean necessarily that you can breathe well. Not at all. Breath is a great leveler. And anyone still alive can work with his or her breath at zero cost and with zero facilities. You don't even need a yoga mat under your arm to work with your breath. It's open to everyone and anyone and anywhere who picks up a maybe a well-thumbed second-hand copy of my book (laughs) set on the right path i think if i remember correctly and i know these numbers might change but i think you said the book is about 14 dollars plus you know x amount for shipping depending on where you are in the world most people that's pretty reasonable Mm-hmm. for something that could transform them. Most people in the developed world. One of my dreams is that I would like there to be an, an Indian edition that perhaps sells for 200 rupees, or, which is about what that, less than $3. Mm. I mean, it's possible. I mean, you've been to the KYM and they're, they're selling books off the shelf for that sort of price. Right. That would be lovely. You know, India is over a billion people. I often find that with the books that I read, they're so high level and so complex. I I really don't see this kind Mm of elegant simplicity Mm -hmm. in a book about optimizing your breath. So I would like to put that and have all of our listeners put that visual out there, that bhavana, Yes. that this could be printed in India for a price that many, many people could benefit from. Exactly. Yes. Thank you for addressing that question. I think that's a question a lot of people want to avoid. <laughs> and they'll specifically run in my email. This uh-huh. is something I don't want to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Whether they're a brown or black person or a person of color, sometimes they're like, no, I'm done. I, I'm sick of talking about this or a Caucasian person that doesn't want to step in the mud and, and say things that are going to be critiqued. So I applaud you for out of all those questions, picking that one out and saying, oh, right. talk about this. Very brave. <laughs> we, we can come back to this question. I have more to say, but maybe you want to move on at this point. Well, I would like to stay with it a little bit longer if you're willing. Do you feel this is a natural extension of the yamas and niyamas? Do you feel this is a bit too political 
and desire that yoga stay free from these discussions. In the 34th Sutra of his second chapter, this is the one place that Patanjali pretty much lays down the law, and I can imagine him wagging his finger. Mm. That says, how we should behave to others, which is in block capitals, we must listen. And then you ask, please tell us why you feel this way. Well, I was very much put down as a child and still feel that people don't listen. So I really feel for people who aren't being heard. Mm. What potentially exactly says is that if we experience thoughts of wishing to do harm in any way, then we need to act immediately to try to see another way of looking at this, possibly to try to see the point of view of some person with whom we might be angry is one example. This, I think, means that we as yoga teachers and therapists have the responsibility to always encourage people to look for another point, see things another way, see another person's point of view. This is so important in relationships to appreciate the other person's point of view. Even if people are doing things wrong, to never wish they should come to harm, certainly never do them harm, and not to condone any harm that may be done to them. This is what potentially says. And this is very much a way of keeping the heart and mind clean and clear. When I was last at the KYM, I asked Mr. Shridharan, no, sir, are the yamas and niyamas necessary for meditation? And so Mr. Shridhar very kindly went away and slept on it and came back the next morning and talked on this subject for an hour. Not surprising. Yes. The yamas and niyamas are essential if we are to practice meditation. These are things we must observe in order to have the peace of mind for you know, any thought about meditation to have any sense. I've heard him speak on this too, and TKB Deskachar, basically saying that if we are very disturbed in our mind about a conversation or an act that we did, or, you know, there's a lot of agitation in the mind, mm. I mean, that comes from the, the yamas. And there is no way to go into deeper states of meditation when you're agitated about this conversation you had three hours ago. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not claiming that I don't sometimes get agitated. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I are mean, human. <laughs> but, but certainly in, in response to one of your questions, I said, I am definitely a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Michael, I think that's a beautiful place for us to wrap it up today. I feel like I personally have so much food for thought and I am thrilled your book. I have told all of our students about it. And I think everyone in the Krishnamacharya tradition, as well as people outside, obviously, will benefit from this. And so I pulled it up on the screen for those of you watching on YouTube. The website is called www.breath, the number four, health.yoga. So B R E A T H, the number four, H E A L T H. Dot yoga and I'll put that in the show notes and so people can order it but it actually will come to them around the end of the year mm -hmm. yeah and then you also have a website that I think if people wanted to get in touch with you could they oh um... yes that's my vintage yoga website <laughs> <laughs> How would you like people to get in touch with you? I know you have a Facebook page and that's Breath for Health on Facebook, B-R-E-A-T-H, the number four, H-E-A-L-T-H. And then on Instagram, your heart first breath. Would that be how you'd like people to contact you if they want to get in touch with you for 
workshops or to take a course from you or to maybe do privates with you? They can. I'm not so confident with social media like Facebook and Instagram. I'm a newbie. I still communicate very much by email, mm. which is michael at twobirdsyoga.com. Great. And I'm writing this down. Which, um, which I'm sure you have somewhere. Yes, I think I do. I just want to put it in my show notes. The other thing I want to say and make a plug for is it's kind of difficult to send books from the UK to different parts of the world. And so I know you and I have talked that whether someone be in Canada or the US, it's possible that you could send a box of books that they could then distribute to their students and colleagues and friends. I hadn't thought about you know, sending a whole box out. Now, my book can be printed in the US. My mm. publisher has printers, and that's how you got your copies. Oh. So that means that if someone were willing to distribute the book, obviously when I distribute myself, I do make a few pounds on each copy. You no, know, I would be happy to forego that to, you know, initially just so that you know people in the US then the book can start to be out there and people can start talking about it because I'm sure my publisher would be very happy to see that going on. Yeah. So And the yeah, world this, needs it, right? I just bought a box of 15 and I'm going to distribute them to students and faculty Mm -hmm. gifts, you know, people that I think could benefit from it. So that might be an option too, to just kind of buy some copies up front and then have them for special people. Yes, I'm sure there are other uh, people, other, other teachers than yourself in the USA might be interested and somehow the word might get out there. Yeah. But in time, you know, when I first had a copy of the book in my hands in February, you know, say how long it was before the book would actually be released. Well, that's four months, nearly. Time goes by and I must be patient and the book, you know, at the end of the year, will be freely available to anyone who can get to a bookseller. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Michael Hutchinson, for being with us today and for taking the time to write this book for us. It's something we've needed for a long time. And I'm just really grateful that you spent your life force creating it for all of us. As we finish up this interview, I just want to go to Reflections on the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali by TKV Deskachar and read what he has to say about Yoga Sutra chapter 2, verse 34. Patanjali explains, a sudden desire to act harshly or to encourage or approve of harsh actions can be contained by reflecting on the harmful consequences. Often such actions are the result of lower instincts such as anger, possessiveness, and unsound judgment. Whether these actions are minor or major, reflection on a suitable atmosphere can contain the desire to act in this way. I have experienced that so much in my own life, that need to poke someone or get back or be right. And it really is an act of spiritual maturity to be able to feel that need to not act upon it, to breathe through it, to go do the emotional digestion about why we're feeling that way or why I'm feeling that way, to maybe speak my needs with satyam in a way that the person that I'm angry with can hear me and then let it go and not hold on to residual resentments and bad feelings. That is an entire lifetime of, of study on how to do that. But to tie that back into Michael's book, I think simply observing our breath and working with our breath is the way to get a stable mind that will allow us to not act with violence. And then as Michael said, when we're working on our yamas and niyamas, we are much more likely to be able to meditate, which is a further reflection on our actions and how we show up in the world. So I think that's a wonderful place to end today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Michael for coming on to the show today. 
And I look forward to seeing you all next week. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria. And Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.